Good morning, my good friends from all over the world. Uh, today we have uh, a great pleasure having with us Mr. Mrs. Higinia uh, Bocalandro. Uh, she, we are bro broadcasting from Perth, Australia, and my dear friend is in Denver, Colorado. Uh, welcome, Higinia. Thank you. It's good to be on your show. Yes. So um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, how did you end up in the hemp business? Well, I'm a, um, I'm from Venezuela, Caracas, como tú. Uh, but I, my family were ranchers as well as uh, farmers. I came to the United States and I actually became enamored of the term sustainability and how to live uh, permaculture design, how to design for permanent uh, life here on earth, not just, and the, and the CO2 levels concerned me. So I started a nonprofit called the Carbon Economy Series, and I began to help farmers in Santa Fe. And I saw that farmers were growing food, they were looking to do organic uh, production for our own health, and they were having tremendous difficulties. And so all of a sudden, I realized if I was going to make an impact, I was going to be able to support farmers to make more money and have them save the small organic farm and create local food production, um, which to me, any type of local uh, production of food or economies is really where wealth begins to, uh, you, you, you can find wealth, you can create uh, legacy uh, projects that bring the young people back to the industry. And so uh, when I we were looking for crops of what could help a small farmer, hemp became the go-to crop. At that time, it was 2014, 2013, CBD had tremendous uh, potential. Uh, we tried and tried in New Mexico. Uh, the Republican governor did not sign hemp into a law. So we came as nomads, as refugees from <laughs> terrible policies towards hemp to Colorado in 2015. And I started working with the farmer that I helped in the Carbon Economy Series because I felt his idea was correct. Organic regenerative farming using innovative crops like hemp and local uh, local uh, spending and commerce and the regenerative aspect of what it means to spend local money. Um, we formed a cooperative, which means that we all own it. And instead of a pyramid where you have the CEO at the top and everybody else at the bottom, we have one level, members, all owners. And so that's another way that makes it more equitable to own a business. Um, uh, yesterday we had the pleasure of talking to a good friend in Paraguay and we mentioned your work in, in that context. Um, uh, but alternative, Higinia, I understand that you must have a lot of, well, not in Colorado, but uh, the, <clears throat> the prohibition must have been uh, uh, obstacles in achieving your goals. Oh, absolutely. We, it's like a dance. We move three steps forwards and two, two steps back. Sometimes one step forward, three steps back. There is a bias uh, and a stigma around the, the word cannabis, uh, which was named marijuana as uh, a way to racially profiling a very, very powerful and wonderful plant and having it controlled by financial interest in the United States in 1936. So, you know, when you get the likes of Rockefeller and the founders of DuPont and the cotton industry and the pharmaceutical industry that uh, created opiates that same year, um, going against a plant and making it illegal and associating it to, you know, black and brown people looking at white men in the eye and disrespecting the women and having those arguments be the ones that made hemp and cannabis illegal in 1936 
you know, lily white America, it, it, you know, those are huge forces. And being a Hispanic woman who is older and, uh, it, it, you know, has made it like, what is she talking about? You know, if she doesn't like the regulations here in the United States, tell her to go home to Venezuela. Now, I became a United States citizen because I believed in taxation with representation. And up until that point, I had lived here for 20 something years with no, uh, no political power. And I decided to make that change and make that difference uh, when Hillary Clinton ran for presidency. I had the great fortune to vote for uh, Obama, a, a black man in a very, very white and divided country. Uh, so, you know, I came for different reasons. I stayed for different reasons. And now I remain for, for, for even more different reasons, which is this country has so much potential. It allowed me to achieve my dreams, which was to be an Olympic luge racer, which I never could have done that in any other country, to develop my skills as a uh, medical professional, health professional, and also now to be on the cutting edge of decriminalizing cannabis and recognizing it for what the value it has on so many levels. And, uh, you know, like the tip of an arrow, take all the hits, you know, because um, it's a huge forces, you know, now that they've figured out that there's so much money in the cannabis world, guess who are the first ones to get all the permits for the cannabis world? The, you know, the, the tobacco and drug industry, uh, the Russian and Las Vegas cartels and Wall Street. So the farmers, the people who have kept these varieties alive, you know, hauling pig crap on their back to their plants in some mountain, they were completely pushed aside for the economic uh, uh, ruling class, the, the predatory capitalism. And the only thing that we can do to go against predatory capitalism is to create our own businesses and trade with the people that share our values. Because when you have a dollar and you spend it in your community, that dollar goes six to six different people in that community. The minute you buy a product from Wall Street, that dollar escapes your community. Now, hemp and local community and regenerative agriculture should be together. And what that means is that when you have a raw material, that's when you can create wealth because you can, with that raw material, create a finished product to do all the means of production and create wealth. Well, hemp has that potential of being that raw material. Then the small entrepreneurs like you and I and the people you interview here will create the innovation, a CBD oil, a textile, a plastic, so many things. And then it's the people around us that buy that product and help us promote that product. And then that allows that money to stay in the community. I mean, think about it. Your dollar goes to the next door neighbor who's the babysitter to your son. Now, she uses that money to uh, go with her friend to buy a milkshake at the local diner. That, per, that guy that owns the local diner pays the local mechanic to tune up and fix his car. So you see how that $1 pops through the community and enriches it in each step. Yes, yes, yes. <clears throat> and Eugenia, after listening to you with such a level of passion and er energy waking up uh, in me, um, this common factor that put us together that in our country where we come from, uh, we always say that uh, in order to achieve a goal or to be successful, you've got to keep the constant, uh, you've got to be constant and steady in, in everything that you're doing. Um, I don't Indeed. know the right translation, but um, it's something like this. 
¿Cómo es en español? Eh, la constancia hace la victoria. Yeah, yes. consistency makes the victory. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you think that I'm victorious. You, you, you keep that thought in your mind, all right? All the time. <laughs> Eugenia, you being a specialist or an expert in, in, in green economy, I, I would like to uh, take this opportunity to, for you to explain the audience what, what it exactly means uh, when, when we are using such a speech of yourself explaining how one, more, one, one dollar can go um, and, and, and reach or make stronger a, co a community, especially those who are in the cannabis business one way or another. Um, it is so important for everyone to have that clear that it is up to us to make this happen. Yeah, it is. Uh, and, you know, I've read and studied with several people, you know, um, Schumacher is one of them who wrote uh, books on local economy. He has he has projects. There's a library. He's really amazing. And then um, I've watched uh, the YouTube of um, an economist named Wolf and his last name is Wolf and um, Richard Wolf. And so he you know, he says that he's been studying how money goes through a community and how we live in what's considered a democracy, right? Here in the United States, people vote and you, you get to essay, but in our working structure, it is a complete monarchy. Um, you know, at the time when we were peasants and we had a lord and a king above us, they would come for their taxes or for their share. We were crop sharing. We were kept poor, but but we got enough to eat, you know, and 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 if you didn't provide, it was like cut off their head. OK, well, now in the in in the world we live in with what I call uh, predatory capitalism, which is looking for a weakness and try to get them in there, which, I mean, let's not mince words. Uh, the reason why there's problems on the southern border of the United States is because United States um, economic policy and military policy has been to destabilize Central and South America and take away their stuff, whatever they got, you know, sell them guns, you know, take their oil, their emeralds, whatever they got, you know. So that type of predatory capitalism is exists really well and it's here everywhere and now they don't pay taxes you know they have offshore accounts they hire people in india and it's going really strongly well the current day is if your boss says do this and you say no then it's the equivalent of off with your head it's like you don't have a job anymore yes. so what we're looking at is, and, and actually, if you see what that causes, it's exactly what's happening right now. The, the distribution of wealth in this country is horrible. It's not distributed. It's not distributed. That's right. It's consolidated and pushed and centralized to six billionaires who own 98% of all the assets of the United States. Yes. You know? So how has that happened? Well, they've been selling everybody that goes to college. They've been selling them a, a, a bunch of goods. They go, go to college, study really hard, work for the man, and then you too can be a millionaire, which is completely false. The only way that you and I can become millionaires, you know, other than, you know, getting the lottery, which that is virtually impossible, is to come up with an innovation, create a product, do what Jeff Bezos did, do what Zuckerman did, do what Jobs did. That's what should be taught in schools today. How can you make how can you make an impact that will financially feed you and your family for the rest of your life? 
by coming up with an innovation, a new product, something that is worth value and bringing it to the world. So, so you know, Richard Wolff talks about that and he does it in such a way that all of a sudden you get it. And so what has to happen is that corporations have to have social responsibility. Um, there's a really good book written by my sister called Do Good at Work. And it, it cites over 150 studies that show that humans made it here, not by competition. They made it here by cooperation. 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 And it was the matriarchal structures that considered the entire village before they declared war on somebody or went and stole stuff that didn't belong to them. And it was so that type of thinking where when I win, we all win is what has to happen in terms of business. And you know what? It exists that way between small businesses, because when I go to the local mechanic who fixes my car and somebody made cookies at my house, I take cookies over there because I know that I asked him to change my oil, but he also fixed the latch that didn't work. And then my seat was halfway that way. And he said, you must, your back must hurt. Let me put another bolt over there. I mean, he's going to do extra stuff for me because I want to do extra stuff for him. Um, Hinia, uh, while you are explaining this, my mind is traveling, yes. even though I'm not, uh, I haven't had my medicine yet. <laughs> <laughs> it, you are absolutely right, and you so smart in your analogy of uh, of the um, this capitalism that is concentrated so much uh, money and so much power in few people. But history itself always balance. Uh, and we are, and I agree with you, we are in a medieval uh, state where the king. Um, his um, court is basically governing all the souls around. It happens during George the 15th in, in France. But we, let's not forget that the people rise and finally use the guillotine to cut his head. And that was the initial of the French Revolution and that led the, uh, the Venezuelan Revolution. Uh, in the 1800s that free us from Spain. So and I don't think that the elite sees exactly what is happening. They are divorced of the reality. Um, the people will wake up violently and there will be a new beginning because I agree with you, what is happening is not natural. It's not right for no one when you have only eight, 10 families that are, you know, live like kings and the rest of the people are starving to death and there are no political solutions to this madness. Plus the fact that we are in a pandemia, created or not or else, is a reality that it will change the history again. That's my belief. <clears throat> Having said that, and the news that I'm getting from Venezuela where people are dying in the streets, the hospitals are not able to cook the people that are sick with COVID or else is, is, is sickening. Um, it's, a, it's kind of depressing knowing that uh, the United States, our only friend in our history are just keep uh, promising and not delivering what we need to overcome this horrible situation there, bring us again to what cannabis can do for the world. And I know that with a mind like you and others like us, we can make a change for the world. Ihinia, do you have something else that you would like to share with the audience? Well, um, the people that made these fortunes will die. And then their kids and grandkids are the ones we have to appeal to. And I, you know, I'm going to quote Buckminster Fuller here, uh, uh, a guy who was an inventor. 
and he was a friend of Paulo Lugari in in uh, in Colombia, who created Las Gaviotas, a sustainable village. Mm -hmm. And uh, Paulo Lugari in Colombia created this sustainable village in the. Uh, like a half a tank of gas away from Colombia towards the east, towards Venezuela. And this was a land, there was nothing. It was like a plain. It did not have water. It did, well, actually it had water 15 feet under, but it was salinated. And it was being fought by three militias. The, the, the government, Colombian government, who was trying to stop the narco traffickers who had their own militia. And then you had the rich landowners who were trying to get the narco traffickers. And so they were like shooting at each other. Nobody even knew if he could live there, but he created a hospital. And so he would treat Whoa. the people who were killing each other. And this village is incredible. It, it's uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez says, uh, he, I, I think he calls it the land of imagination, but anyway, Paulo Lugari is, is famous and his whole thing is that we need to restore the vegetative skin of the planet to balance the, the atmosphere and stop global warming. Um, and that, you know, for me, air is the most important thing because we can't live without it for more than a few minutes. And so that balance, and, and because it's the problem seems so huge, then people just think, well, we can't do anything about it. But what I want to say is that we have found how to, you know, wherever human beings are, we create deserts. But in the last 50 to 100 years, we have found how to build soil and how to restore the the soil biology under the soil in a way which it grabs the carbon from the air and puts it back into the soil which then means that the water that follows the carbon goes into the soil instead of as storms and tsunamis and all kinds of you know earth dis or life disrupting phenomena now what what we know is we have to create a system that works. We have to create our solutions and stop criticizing the people behind us. So when Lugari wanted to create something sustainable, he talked to Buckminster Fuller and Buckminster Fuller says, don't spend a half a minute criticizing anybody else's thing, make something that works. And Paulo Lugari went and put solar water heaters. I was in Colombia and he showed me around in like a hospital in a university and he made enough money off of the solar water heaters that he was saving money to heat their water um to create the village and then when he was in the village they told him you live off of grants and off of uh students that come here and work for free you know it's like what's sustainable about that and so he realized oh i need a crop so he knew that venezuela had these uh, tropical pines and from the tropical pines, they were getting like six different products, you know, these terpenes that are good for all kinds of chemical things. Um, you know, they could use and, and they wouldn't kill the tree. They would, it would be like a maple syrup. They'd be pulling the, the terpenes off and keeping the forest there. So he sent people to Venezuela to find out how to do it. And they bought like a million pines and they planted them and then they it started growing. And at the end of like six years, he had planted like 8 million pines. And there was, and he was doing it exactly how the people in the university's latest agronomy forestry were telling him, which they have to be this far apart. You have to clean underneath, you know, all this stuff. First of all, he thought the trees were too close together. That's not the way they like it. So he put them a little further apart. And then there was this one area where it was at the end, they didn't maintain it. When they came back two years later, there was 268 species. Oh, wow. The seeds were in the soil. And the reason that they didn't come up was because they didn't have a shade, a something to break the water, something to create right. once the pine tree was there. So those, and not only that, okay, so now they had 
pine tar and terpenes. And I went there, I have the pictures. One day we should do a, 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 an entire program on the whole thing so you could see how brilliant it is. They desalinated the water. Oh. The water underneath this, what came up was the old Amazon. So the Amazon reached the Caribbean Ocean at one point. The wow. seeds were there. So here's this dude. He now brings stuff to the to Las Gaviotas and then fills up these bottles with water and exports water. And then there's another crop. And then uh, people are asking, what is the business behind this the self-sustainability? <laughs> right. Now there's another guy who's his friend, and his name is Gunther. Uh, Pauly, and he wrote the the Blue Planet. I believe it's called the Blue Planet. And he starts by saying, "We're a blue planet. We're four fifths water." And then he says, "And we've destroyed this planet." And I believe in the blue economy. And he his blue economy is 100 innovations that, if they were put into place, they would allow us to clean up the mess and create more revenue and better life. So. Now that we've screwed up a bunch of stuff, why not get the young people, the engineers, the people who are the visionaries to figure out how to take care of the plastic, how to, you know, put build soil, how to sequester carbon. Do you know that if we increase the top soil of all arable land, all land that is suited for agriculture, not the Rocky Mountains, but the plains, if we increased three inches of topsoil, the amount of bacteria, fungi, nematodes, the, the, the biology under there would sequester enough carbon to halt carbon, um, the, the, the carbon problem. Not only that, but without stopping one car. Because one of the things that the United States did, and you have to like look at it and go, wow, is they decided there's a pollution problem. So that means that any developing nation can't have cars because we have them all. So, so all the solutions have been dictated upon the people. Okay. You want to help? Don't pollute. Don't, you know, put weather stripping, make sure you do this, but the systems, the archaic systems of energy grids, they lose 70% of the energy by the time it goes from the power, uh, source or coal plant to your house. Why are they asking us to weather strip our window when it's only 30% of the energy? You know what I mean? It's so, so in a way, the system, everything is really archaic and it's being held together by financial interests of the very ultra wealthy. So when I, so the last thing that I wanted to say, and I know it's long is create the solution. And create the solution, a better, and the solution a better alternative. Here. And the solution is hemp. Well, that's one of them. But you know, Whatever. if you grab hemp and you do the same thing that you did with cotton or with wheat in this country, you are part of the problem because mm. you're continuing erosion, over irrigation, the overuse of pesticides, petroleum inputs. And then now you got to go get a loan from a bank so that they can bankroll your whole thing. And at the end of the season, hope that you make more money than not. So hemp like any solution has to be done in an, in a regenerative agriculture, in an organic way. And at the small, so what we're doing here in Colorado is we're empowering a hundred, a uh, hundred um, Farmer. small farmers to make a hundred thousand dollars each a year, instead of one to make a million, you know, which is the way that it tends to go. Now, the most exciting thing that we're doing right now is genetics here in Colorado. We have the first uh, genetic called Unicorn. She was very hard to find. It's a CBD plant. It's guaranteed to not go over the 0.3 THC and remain hemp. It has a really good terpene profile, and it is now part of the USDA agricultural horticulture academic scientific Aosca, which is this, the one that, that regulates all seeds and anything you grow. If you want a russet potato, that's how you get it. If you want a Rome, you know, a, a, a 
a type of zucchini, that's, it's all there. And the intellectual property is being protected. And um, it's the first time ever that cannabis has been part of that. And so we're very proud of it because now the farmers are safe. They're not um, gonna lose their crop because it goes to marijuana. So we're gonna have to find a way to grow that in Australia. And you know what? It's uh, we're gonna have to do studies because it, you know, it grows well here, but it might not grow well there. But we do have cell culture. Um, and cell culture is it will go in a test tube in the mail. And if and if it's a university that can grab the cell culture and create clones and, and actually our university here can work with them. And I actually think that that might be faster um, if you have the right academia behind it, which most people are super into it because, you know, in academia, you publish or you perish and and nobody has published in the realm of hemp or cannabis virtually. So anybody who's in it has plenty to write about. Well, you know any smart PhDs in the know about genetics over there in Perth? Uh, yes, uh, there are plenty. And I'm pretty sure that after this discussion, something will pop up. I'm having discussion with the unis for plastic hemp, but uh, that is something else. Yes, uh, but the genetics definitely it is uh, something that we have to look at. Ihinia, uh, with an example like yours, with a mind like yours, with a background like yours, there is, there is hope in this earth. Hope for a lot of people that I know that will be uh, following something so beautiful that you're working with. Uh, thank you, thank you, Hinia. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. And, and thank you for putting these on and getting the word out. Uh, we're trying to do our best. <laughs> Ciao. Bendiciones. <laughs> Igualmente, te quiero. Muchas gracias. Amén, mi amor. Chao.